Good evening and welcome to another class on the Book of Judges. Uh, today, actually, we're going to finish, we're going to try to finish the book and um, see where we end up. Uh, remember that we started this book with great expectations. We started the book um, with, uh, um, after Joshua, and people thinking that, uh, and people conquering the land and the tribes in their proper places. We noted that they didn't finish, they didn't conquer every single part, but, but on the whole, they, uh, Joshua was a very positive time period and he was a very strong leader. And we had great expectations that um, that's what, uh, that would continue. But very quickly, uh, during the course of the Book of Judges, we noted that uh, this was not to be the case. And the children of Israel, what happened was they ended up in, uh, they ended up very spread apart. They ended up each in their own tribe, doing their own thing, not really talking to each other, and sometimes even, even fighting with each other, as we're going to see in today's class. And it became a real tragedy. And one of the strongest messages that you walk away with from the book of Judges is this lack of unity that can grip and corrupt and destroy the children of Israel. Of course, Jews have been struggling with this question of unity for thousands of years. I mean, it's not for uh, no reason that uh, there's a joke that says that if there are two Jews, there are three synagogues. Um, and that's uh, an unfortunate reality of, uh, until today. Uh, we're somewhat divisive. Uh, we're co comfortable with our own uh, groups and we stay amongst ourselves. And um, when you get to the land of Israel, you don't have that luxury. Uh, you have to engage with others and uh, choose a leader. So uh, it's a complicated system. And this uh, is very clear in the book of Shoftim, where we have a leader, one judge who was good in this part of Israel for 20 years. But at the same time, in this part of Israel, there was, there were, there was another enemy because they were sinning. So they had a different judge. And you, you never get the sense that there was like unity, that they were, that they were together. And that's the sad uh, reality of the book of Shoftim. And perhaps that is the reason that the book of Samuel focuses on a king. Because who's going to bring people together other than a strong king who will stand and represent the entire nation? And it, it, it's, it's hard to deny that there's a necessity for a strong leader. Now, you know, could be a king, could be a great prophet, a great priest. But this story that we're going to read, these stories um, are proof that um, there's something lacking. And uh, that is something that, um, that has terrible, terrible consequences as we're going to read. We begin our discussion in chapter 17 and we'll see how far we can reach. There was a man in the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micha or Michiahu or Micah, okay? Which uh, it's, it's, it's normal for um, people in ancient times till today to have names that are called theophoric, which means that part of the name refers to God. So you'd have an expectation that this is like Yehoshua, right? God's name in it. Like, um, um, Shlumiel and Tzuri Shaddai and um, Eliyahu, okay? So all of these have God's name. So you expect that if a person has God in his name, then he's going to be a spiritual person. He's going to be a morally upright person. He's going to be a God-fearing person. Lo and behold, we start reading the story. He turns to his mother and he says, you know that 1,100 shekels? of silver, which must have been a fortune, that were stolen from you, and you made some kind of swear, you cursed anyone who, who the person who stole it from you, by the way, that was me. So the mother says, 
blessed of the Lord be my son. Now, the mother is invoking the name of the Lord, kind of agreeing to the idea that it was her son who took the money and not someone else. So God is certainly part of this story. But then, then it takes a strange turn. He returned the 1,100 shekels to his mother, but his mother said, no, I already consecrated the silver to the Lord. In other words, when, when you lose something, you say, oh, I just want it back. I, I'm willing to donate it all to, the, to God. So once that happens, even if you get the money, you can't use that. Okay, it's special holy money. So she said, listen, I, um, I've given that money to God. Transferring it to my son to make a golden image, I now return it to you. So then all of a sudden, what just happened? I don't understand. And look in verse four. So when he gave the silver back to his mother, his mother took 200 shekels, gave it to a, a smith. He made it into a sculptured image and a molten image, which were kept in the house of Micah. So what a kind of crazy warped story here, right? He had, they have God, but they also have other gods, right? That's called the polytheistic society that Judaism was trying to root out. Like there is no such thing as God and the other God, God and the idols. This is just the one God. And yet that's exactly what they did. They made an idol and put it in the house of Michaihu, the one who who has God's name. He, he turns his house into, look in verse five, a house of God. Now, not the God that we're comfortable with, because it, he had idols, but nevertheless, some kind of spiritual place. And he became the priest. He just appointed himself a priest, made an idol, and called himself a, a holy man. And that's why the, the, the Navi says in verse 6, in those days there was no king, and every man did as he pleased. Okay, so we have the sense here that, uh, that they want to do something spiritual, but there's no real authority, so they just make, make stuff up, and then that leads to idolatry. There was another man from Beit Lechem Yehuda, from uh, Beit Lechem in Judah, um, and he was a lady, <clears throat> happened to live there. And he decided to go you know, on his way, he was looking for work, and he came and met Micha, and Micha says, hey, what's going on? Uh, where are you coming? Where are you going? So the man says, you know, I'm walking around. I'm a Levite. So Micha says, you know what? I've got a job for you. Stay with me. Be my priest. And I will give you, you know, a good income and some food. Hey, everyone's got to have a job. But Yoel Halevi Lashevet Taish. So this Levite decided it's a good, a good idea. Yes, it's, it's idolatry, but you know everyone's got to make a living, so it's 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 fine. So Micha has you know this Levite, and he becomes his priest, and sits in the house of Micha. And Micha says, Ah, now I know that God is with me because I have a Levite. For my, to be my, my priest. Now that story is just bizarre, right? Uh, it means that full circle, that there is no, no understanding of godliness anymore. Remember, please, that there is the temple. The temple is in a place called Shiloh. There is a priest there. There is prophecy at this time. And yet, in Harafrayim, not far from it, they're worshiping idolatry and they think that God is going to bless them. Chapter 18 continues this theme. In other words, when you have a breakdown of unity and a breakdown of authority, it, it cuts through the two areas of morality in Judaism. One morality is idolatry. It's like morality of that God is in the world. 
And another morality is how you treat people. So when you don't have um, either of those things, or when you don't have a central authority, a king, then you, um, you lose that as well. Now, um, chapter 18 begins um, that we moved from Ephraim to the tribe of Dan. And in Dan, there's, uh, there's no king once again. And in Dan is, is, is looking to find the, a tribe for themselves. So they, um, so, excuse me, honey. So they, um, they send out five people to check out the land, to see where they can come to, to, uh, to settle. And they come to um, Ephraim. I'm in the middle of a, re a recording class. I mean recording. So they they come to Ephraim, right, where Micha is. And they decide, okay, they hear the priest or the Levite. And they, um, they said, who, who brought you here? What are you doing here? What's going on? Because it doesn't make sense that they're in Har Ephraim. They're from Dan, which is, you know, near Beit Shemesh. They go up to Har Ephraim and they see a Levite there from Judah. In other words, everything is mish, everything is mixed all over the place. And uh, the priest, this guy says, listen, I, uh, I came to this guy's house. He's got a lot of money. He hired me to be his priest. So they said, okay, go ask God, right? He's saying this to the priest with the idol in his house. Go ask God if we should join, if this should be, you know, this is a plan that we should have. Um, and God, God says, uh, yes, your mission will be successful. This is not, this is their version of God, right? So the five people come to a place called Laish and um, they see the um, people that, were, that are there, verse seven, five men went on Laish, they observe the people, they're hanging out like the Tzidonim, non-Jews that are living in the north. Tranquil, calm people with no one, you know, to hurt them, and they were distant. So they decide, okay, they come back to their uh, kinsmen and they and said, well, what'd you find? They said, let's go once, let's attack them. Well, we found a bunch of people that are living quietly and calmly, and we should go and uh, destroy them. Go and invade the land. Right? And then they said, for God has delivered it into your hand. Um, God delivered into his hand because they spoke to this idolatrous priest working for Mipha, and he said, yeah, you're going to be successful. Um, and when you come, there'll be an unsuspecting people there, and the land is spacious there. So they go, they went, they went from Torah and Eshta'o. By the way, Eshta'o was where Shimshon was, if we remember. And they were 600 strong, and they went up into Kiryat Yarim, and they, um, they passed on to the hill country of Ephraim. They arrived at the house of Micha. And they said, you know, there's an ephod and a sculptured image, right? They turned off there, entered the home of the young Levites, and they greeted him with 600 men from Dan stand at the entrance of the gate. While the five men who had gone on to spy the land went inside and took the sculptured image. They basically stole it from him. Okay? And those men entered Micha's house and they took the image and the ephod and all their gods. And we said, what are you doing? He said, be quiet. Come with us and be our father and priest. Would you rather be priest to one man, this guy Micha, or would you rather be priest to an entire tribe of Dan? Well, the priest realized he just got an upgrade and he said, fine. So he, he went with them. In other words, in those days, whoever is the highest bidder, whoever is um, going to pay him the most, 
and give him the most honor, that he's going to take his idolatry and he's going to go and he's going to become the priest. This is a, um, a, 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 a corruption of everything that we have learned from the time of the Bible, from the time of the temple until now, because everything breaks down when you don't have the education and when you're at the, the end of the book of, of Shoftim, no one's been teaching, no one's been learning what's going on, and therefore they end up with uh, this kind of situation. Well, they've gone some distance from Micha's house. When the men in the house is near Micha, caught up to the Danites, and they said to Micha, what's going on? What have you done? You've taken my priest. Micha said, you've taken my priest and the gods that I made, and you walked off, and what, what, what do I have left? So they said, listen, you don't shout at us, all right? Otherwise, people will attack you and you'll lose your lives. So Micha realizes these men are stronger. Might is right. There's nothing left to do. So he turns back and he goes home. And the Danites go on their way. So they, um, they, they come up to this, this city, Laish. And um, it's all quiet. The people are sitting there comfortably. And they, uh, they kill everyone and burn the, house, burn the city down. Obviously, this was not done sanctioned by God. This was not done with any Jewish morals here. They simply went and smote everyone and put a, um, uh, you know, said, now this is our new city. This is our new tribe. This is our new area. That's why Dan went from the south up to the north, and that became the new, uh, the new tribe of Dan. Um, now, here's a strange story, and um, we'll just say one line about it in verse 30. The Danites set up the sculptured image for themselves. Total idolatry, okay? And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Menashe, were the priests until um, um, during the entire time that the, uh, the temple was in Shiloh. In other words, there was a second temple in the north that was run by the tribe of Dan, and the priests were none other than the family of Yehonatan, the son of Gershom, who's the son of Minnasha. There is a Midrash. And it's very painful. And it might not be shot. You know, the shot might be that Minnasha is a guy named Minnasha. But let's say you take the word, the letter Nun, out of the word Minnasha. What do you get? You get the son is is Jonathan, the son of Gershom, who's the son of Moshe. According to a Midrash, it's none other than Moshe's grandson who becomes the priest for hire for idolatry in the tribe of Dan in the north of Israel. Now there's a whole thing to say about that in terms of Moshe and his sons and the relationship that he had and the sacrifices that you make and what uh, expectations are when you're Moshe. And we never hear much of, we, all, we do know that his sons are Gershom and Eliezer. We don't hear more about that until we get to this story and we wonder if this Gershom, the son of Menashe, is really Gershom, the son of Moshe. And Yonatan, his son. So that's a, a frightening story. Anyway, here's a second chapter. Right? There are three chapters. Each chapter describes what happens when anyone gets to do what they want. It's anarchy. And it's anarchy on a religious level, on a moral level to God. And anarchy to God causes anarchy to man. And men start doing what they choose and what they please. And they end up as we're going to see even in the next chapter, where you, I, you, you can't imagine how things can get worse and yet get ready for the most, I, I think it's the worst story in the Bible. Okay, are you ready to learn the worst story in the Bible? So we are going to learn the story of 
what's called the Pilegesh Vigida. Okay. Chapter 19. It starts the same way that the previous chapter started. In those days, there was no king. Okay, and when there's no king, there's chaos and there's immorality. And people take the law into their own hands. And comes along a story that is harrowing. We're still in the mountains of Ephraim. And in the mountains of Ephraim, there was a Levite. So it's the same also story that there was this Levite, and he, he decided to take a Pelegesh. A Pelegesh from Bethlehem, Yehuda, a concubine. Okay? Now, she, um, she was from the town of Bethlehem, Yehuda. It doesn't say much about her. Um, but it does say that um, once his concubine deserted him, she left him for her father's house in Beit Lechem, and she stayed there for four months. So apparently, you know, they got into a fight, or there was a problem, and she was uncomfortable, and so she went back home. But the husband, husband, you know, the man from Linda, he goes and, 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 and brings her back. He speaks to her, he says, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. I might have um, been wrong to you. I might have hurt you, uh, but, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be much, much better now. Okay? So the, fa- the girl's father sees this man who's a wealthy man, who's an important man, and um, he, he says, you know, stay with us. So he holds on to the man. Of course, he didn't want his daughter to be alone. You know, it's always in those days, it's so important that he was with a, with a man. So they stayed for three days and they drank and they ate. Very nice. And on the fourth day, um, on the fourth day, they get up early to go. Yeah, we're going back home. No, the father of the, of the girl says to his uh, somewhat son-in-law and says, no, 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 let's eat another meal and then you'll go. They sit down. They eat a meal. They drink. He says, you know what? Stay another night. And um, he gets up to uh, leave and the father-in-law kind of says, Forces, urges him to stay, urges him. Anyway, on the fifth day, he says, stay one more day. They eat. The man gets up to go with his pilagesh, his concubine. And he says, you know what? It's almost nighttime. Stay another night. The man didn't want to. He said, I had enough, I, I, I'm bringing my wife, you know, my back, and it's been six days. Even though it's close to, to the evening, I'm taking her and we're leaving. So they start on their road, back up north, and they pass by the Yehus, which is Yerushalayim. Now, he is traveling with his Pilegesh, with his concubine, towards uh, his home, and... Um, The attendant said to them, listen, let's turn aside to the town of the Yebusites and spend the night in it. So he said, we're not going to sleep with the Ye- Yebusites. I mean, they're not, not, they're not Hreem, they're not Jews. Let's go rather to one of the places that are closer in, a, in the Giv'a or the Ramah. Let's go to a place called Giv'a. And that's our people. So they go. In verse 14, they have Ruva Elehi, and they come, the sun sets, and then they're in the tribe of Benjamin, right? They're making their way from Judah north to Benjamin, ultimately back up to Har Ephraim. And they come to uh, Giv'ah, and it's nighttime, and no one wants to take them to their house. 
So they don't understand. Judaism is built on chesed, on kindness, and um, no one's uh, no one's listening to them. And there was an old man. He says, "What are you doing here?" He says, "Well, I'm from Harafrain, and uh, you know." He sees, this old man sees, he says, he tells a story and he says, we're, we're from Beit Lechem and we're going to hire Ephraim and we need a place to stay. So the man says, okay, I'll give it to you. Don't worry, I'll take care of you. Don't worry, just don't sleep in the street. It's not nice. He brings him into his house. He feeds the donkeys. He washes their feet. That's, this is the chesed we're talking about. So there is a, you know, a good man who does good chesed. So everything seems fine. Verse 22. They're sitting there eating quietly in the giva, Happy, content. And then the men of the city, the men of the Jews of, of Benjamin, who are evil, surround the house and knock on the door. And they said, bring out the man who is in your house, the guest, and we want to know him. Now, they were rather depraved, and uh, clearly they were not um, going to sit and shake his hand and have a nice time with him. They, were, they wanted to you know, abuse him in some, some way. They wanted to sexually abuse him. So he says, please. The owner of the house says, he knows them, right? He says, don't, don't, don't do this. Don't dishonor this man. You know what? Here is my daughter, the virgin. and his concubine, you can have them instead. Now, where's your, our moral, you know, compass? It's gone. The men want to attack, want to maybe uh, uh, molest this man, but the man was more important. So the owner of the house says, you know, here, take my virgin daughter and take this concubine and uh, do with one them as you please. Well, the men would not listen to him. So the man seized his concubine and pushed her out to them. And they raped her and abused her all night long until morning. And they let her go when dawn broke. Toward the morning, the woman came back. And as it was growing light, she collapsed at the entrance of the man's house where her husband was. And when her husband arose in the morning, he opened the doors and went out to continue the journey. And there was his woman, the concub his concubine, laying at the entrance. He said, let up, let, get up. But she was near death. She was basically dead. So what does he do? He goes inside. And he takes, he goes into his home and he takes a, a, a knife and he cuts her up into 12 parts. And he sends a part of his wife to every um, tribe of Israel so that everyone could know what the tribe of Benjamin did to this woman. And the, the Navi says that this never happened since the time they came out of Egypt, something so horrifying. Now this shook the foundations of the people of Israel. They understood at how far they sank that people should allow uh, a woman to be raped and destroyed like this because there's such evil that, that took them over. So the, um, in chapter 20, everyone, other than obviously the tribe of Benjamin, okay, everyone gathered an army 
400,000 strong to fight against the tribe of Benjamin. And they, the Benjamins heard that the Israelites were coming up to them. And they said, well, what happened? I don't understand. Well, why are all, all of a sudden everyone coming to attack us? As if they didn't know. So the people said, it's because of this woman that was murdered in the Giva that belonged to Benjamin. The citizens of Giva set out to harm me. They gathered against me around the house in the night and meant to kill me. And then they ravished my concubine until she died. So I took hold of the concubine, I cut her into pieces and said, this is what happens. This is what you end up doing. Now you are all Israelites. You better produce a plan of action right now. All the people rose and one man and declared, we will not go back to our homes. We will not enter our houses, but we will go and fight against Kipa. We will take from all the tribes, 10 men to the hundred and a hundred to the thousand, a thousand to the 10,000 to supply provisions to prepare for the going together in Benjamin. And this is exactly what happened. And all the tribes sent men saying, what is this evil that has happened among you? Now you, you people of Benjamin, you better hand over the, the people of Gib'ah, so we'll put them to death and stamp the evil out from Israel. But the Benjamins wouldn't yield, they're, they're their countrymen. So the Benjamins, the people from the tribe of Benjamin gathered from the Gib'ah in order to fight. And on that day, they brought 26,000 uh, fighting men. Men of Israel mustered 400,000 warriors. And they proceeded to Beit El to ask God, who of us should fight against Benjamin? And God, and this is the true God, said Judah should fight first. And the men of Israel took the field against the Benjamins and, um, and actually, they were very strong and they struck down 22,000 men of Israel. But then the army of Israel rallied against and drew up in battle. And they, they wept before God and they, uh, they did repentance and they said, who should fight against them? And they invite against the Benjamins on the second day. And 18,000 Israelites fell. So now there's 40,000 of the Confederate army of Israel that falls to the Benjamites. So they all came to Beit El and they're saying, why is this happening to us? We're doing the right thing. And they fasted that day until evening and presented burnt offerings and well-beings to the Lord. And they inquired once again from the Ark of the Covenant and Pinchas, the son of Elazar and Aaron said, shall we go and fight the Benjamins? And the Lord answered, go up for tomorrow, I'll deliver them in your hands. And they put an ambush and the third day the Israelites went up and the Benjamins went out to meet them. And um, they started out by striking the men dead, but in the end, they, did the, they, they defeated 25,100 men of Benjamin. That's, that's 900 short of the entire army. And the chapter continues to say uh, another, that another day, 18,000 fell, another 5,000, another 2,000. Um, and it ends saying 600 men turned and fled to the wilderness to, to Ramon, and they remained there. And the men of Israel turned back to the rest of the Benjaminites and put them to the sword, killing men, women, and child. And they set the whole place to fire. And look in chapter 21, they made an oath that no one from Israel is allowed to marry into the tribe of Benjamin as a result of this. Basically, they were excising a tribe of Israel as a result of what, what, what happened. And everyone was crying and everyone was, was up in arms because this is the level to which everyone of the children of Israel fell. Now, um, the, 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 the chapter does end in a positive way that they made some kind of... Um, recompense. They, they did uh, allow, in fact, we have a Mishnah that says that uh, on the two Ba'av, the 15th day of Ab, 
we, we celebrate that they allowed the uh, Jews to the tribes to once again marry the tribe of Benjamin after a certain while. But the story is, okay, that this is what happens when there's no king, when everyone does what they think is right. And this is the sordid tale of what, with the greatest expectations of what Joshua left them, what ends up in the book of Shoftim. It ends up not only moral depravity to God, that the, I'll make my own God and I'll make my own idols and I'll make everything the opposite of the Bible, but that turns to moral depra depravity to people and you, the way you treat people and the way you do this led to the greatest civil war in the history of, um, or one of the great civil wars where so much death and on both sides. And it took many, 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 a long time for them to return to a way that they can finally um, still remain one nation. Uh, and this is how the book of Shoftim ends. So that's a lot. Next week, we're going to start the book of Samuel, and we're going to learn how this Samuel is a response to the terrible tales of what happens in the book of Judges. But until then, I wish you all a Shabbat Shalom and a good week. Thank you. Bye.